Thank you all for coming. Uh, thanks, DEF CON, for having me up here. I've, as Juris mentioned, I've been involved here in a lot of different ways, um, but this is the first time I've actually been up on the stage, so it means a lot. Um, do we have any car enthusiasts in the audience? Yeah, okay. Um, any of you ever had to have had problems with your emissions testing? Yeah, we're going to have some fun. Okay. <laughs> So um, I assume you all can see something. I can't see shit. But we're going to talk about the ODB2 systems in uh, cars and what we can uh, have fun with. Um, so this is a car I bought about 10 years ago. It's a fun, you know, uh, go-kart of a car. It has a little quirk about it. Um, anybody know what this car is? Anybody? Yeah, so we got the, the Wankel rotary motor in it. Um, and specifically, these things love to kill catalytic converters. Um, but I, at the time, I was living in Kansas City, and they don't do emissions testing. Oh, by the way, did he mention uh, set KC? Yeah, so we'll, we'll get wrap around to that. But um, So, you know, it's not there. We don't have to worry about it. So I enlisted my little helper, and we were like, fuck that. Get it out of here. Um, so life was good for about eight years. Um, then I decided, well, let's move to the West Coast. Turns out, um, they don't like that so much around here. However, as I was digging into the laws, they had the statute that it got me kind of excited. It said, um, for collectible vehicles, we, we don't do uh, emissions testing. I'm thinking, well, this car is kind of unique. It's, it's old, they don't make it anymore. It's the last time they made this type of motor. Um, so I'm like, well, yeah, let's, let's start digging into this. And then, you know, used infrequently, sign me up, right? Um, we're gonna, this is how I'm gonna get in. But then they had this last little thing at the end. It's like every person must have, every person who's of a driving age in your house must also have another car. Um, I've been working from home for like ever, and I drive this car less than 5,000 miles a year, maybe once a week, right? So not only do I have to have this car that I never drive, but I have to have another car registered to me that I never drive, right? And motorcycles don't count. Lots of, lots of other like fun little things don't count. You have to have a car that you can drive every single day, regardless of the fact that my wife works from home, I work from home, we take the kids to school. That's it, right? So we're like, well, glad. I, I'm a kind of a hoarder, so I still have the catalytic converter and all that kind of crap, and you put it back in. Um, a thing about that, if you don't ever have to do emissions testing, and it's never a concern of yours. If you just put the stuff back in there and you go and try and get it tested, there's this thing that happens in the computer that they don't really ever tell you about unless you have to deal with it. Um, so I was like, what the fuck does it mean to not be ready? And uh, you know, you dig into it, and I pull up the service manual, and sure enough, after you reinstall these parts, and it turns out anytime you reset the battery, you're gonna have to go through the cycle. Drive the car up to a certain speed, let it idle for so long, and go into. Then, meanwhile, you have to have the air conditioner off and all that stuff. Did I mention I live in the desert? Uh, <laughs> driving a car around for 40 minutes to do this with the air conditioner off is not fun. So, but you know, I try for months, like doing this thing while I, in the time that I don't actually drive this car, um, and I just can't get rid of these goddamn readiness monitors. And so, I'm like, what the hell? Um, so let's throw back to DEF CON 26. Mentioned I was set KC. Anybody heard of the badge pirates here? Yeah. So this was their first badge they made um, as part of a set KC kind of let's have fun. We're going to be part of badge life, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I, as part of it, I made this little add-on to my badge and you know, hooked it into the uh, ECU and it could read the oil temperature and water temperature and stuff. So I was like, yeah, I've done this before. You know, at the time as a UART adapter, no problem. It, it's a little higher level, but really, like, how hard can it be, right? So um, I start digging into the protocol. There's an authentication mechanism in the front. We're like, okay, there, you know, I, I've got to bypass that at some point, right? There's something that's going to happen. Anybody who's familiar with Canvas right now is going, oh, yeah, okay, I know where this is going. Um, a basic uh, data frame. As I dug in to the next part, by the way, the references for all these are on. The, I'm not going to go there. We only got 20 minutes. We're going to keep this moving. Um, zero to eight are the possible authentication IDs. Okay. So when I saw that, is the moment when I went, you know what? Maybe I don't have to do this the right way. I can just, you know, kind of tell the computer to do 
what I wanted to do. Um, so I did what any sane person would do and uh, put together a breadboard that let me uh, hook up a logic analyzer. Um, and that's kind of what it looks like from, you know, just you can buy these things off of Amazon for a couple of bucks and you hook them up. Um, but then you plug in a logic analyzer and anybody who is familiar with CAN bus knows this part, but anybody who's just kind of getting into analyzing hardware uh, signals, um, you'll notice that the signal never goes near zero. So you have, it's uh, plus 2.5 up or down over 1.7 volts, I believe. Um, and it's inverted together to cancel noise and all that stuff. So if you want to be able to use like a Salia logic analyzer or any of the cheaper stuff, you need to do a little bit of messing around. So this is what we call a DC filter or an AC coupling. And you're essentially just removing that low level, D low level DC voltage from the signal so that you can get something like this. Um, and also I added a cap in there that rounds off the top so you get a nice square wave. But square being relative. Um, so now we see data, right? At the top of the screen, we can see it's actually starting to parse data. We're not going to dig into it too much, but um, that's at least we can confirm what we read in the document is what we're seeing, right? And it's good. Um, but what I really wanted to do was, hey, how can I respond to this thing in a programmatic way? Uh, so you know, these things now, they don't even bother to separate them. Um, you, I can't fucking see the screen. Um, <laughs> sorry. The, uh, you pay six bucks for six of these. They don't split them up. You just pop them off or whatever. But these are your, your transceivers. I have ESP32s laying around the house. Anybody who plays with these kind of things have them, right? Um, it has a built-in CAN bus controller, but it doesn't have a transceiver. So you need one of these. They're a couple of bucks. You get them off of Amazon, plug it in, and then you can start seeing this kind of stuff. It's actually acknowledging packets and um, uh, instead of just being able to listen to it. So as we dig in a little bit deeper, we see there's the identifier field, which is fixed, by the way. The zero is the ECU, so you just tell it you're the ECU. You tell it uh, this is the received packet from the scanner. It's saying, well, there's a link, there's a service, there's a PID. Turns out there's this handy little thing called Wikipedia. You go in and you look it up, and it tells you exactly what it's looking for. And then you go back to the other page where they have this little decoder tool that says, oh, um, I can, you know, if you receive this message, this is how you would want to respond and, and construct the frame. So we have a response, right? So now you can see it's being sent on both. It's a, a uh, it responds on both sides when you send a message. So uh, echo, I believe, uh, what we call it. Uh, but then we have this error that happens right after we respond to the goddamn thing. And this is what happens. So this is the little cheap scanner you can buy anywhere. Um, that I just use for clearing messages and stuff. But the goal at first was like, can I even fool this thing? Um, that screen I looked at for probably two months. Uh, turns out these kinds of things are pretty complicated. It's just so many different layers that you're worried about. Um, yeah, you just got to make sure you're keeping track of every little piece. And it didn't help that at this time, I had lots of friends on Twitter going, AI coding agents are awesome. You should really look into these, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, great. I'm in this really, really complicated project. Now's a great time for me to start exploring AI coding tools. Um, malicious ignorance is about the best uh, word I can, or phrase I can come up with to describe that experience. Um, something it's really, really good at uh, the, like, writing registers, reading back registers, debugging information, all that kind of crap it was really, really great at. It thinks about hardware like a high school level kid who just read a book on hardware thinks, right? It had convinced me that I knew nothing about hardware at all. And the protocols were just garbage and everything that I thought I knew was just terrible. Um, don't listen to it, right? Uh, half of what we're going to do with these things is figure out how to teach them. But in the process, I ended up actually abandoning the entire design of the original one. Uh, digging in a little bit deeper, I learned the CAN bus controller on this thing is actually kind of a pseudo 
copy of whatever the, the SJA 1000 proper one was, and there are some details that they don't expose that you really need to know when you're figuring out all the timing and all that kind of crap. So I went with an external spy controlled one, which has the secondary benefit of later on, I actually wanted to proxy on the same board without having to like chain two ESPs together. So I'm like, I know I can run multiple spy buses. I'm sorry if I'm high leveling some of this stuff. Um, you're just going to have to look it up later. We only have 20 minutes. Um, <laughs> But um, yeah, faster, faster, faster. So we've gone through, we have it working, and sure enough, we have a working response to the scanner. This is very, very phase one, gone through all this. But within the end of the day, we have this thing reading out exactly what we want. So these are the same screens that we saw earlier that where I was like, God damn, I just can't get it to do what I want. Now I've proven this concept of like, OK, we can actually show, um, show that we can convince this little crappy scanner to do what we want. So, you know, I have an emulator working, and I had some working knowledge of the AI thing. I forked it off and said, hey, turn it into a proxy for me. Let's see what happens. It can't hurt, right? Um, so, turns out, it actually didn't do a real bad job. Um, but the ultimate uh, incarnation of this thing is you've got the two breakout boards. One goes to your scanner side, one goes to your ECU side. Um, and installed, it looks like this. I mean, it looks, you, if you've ever crawled under the dashboard and looked through your, looked at your ODB2 plug, you've got a legit looking thing. And that's part of the thing. Um, and I should mention too, in the state where I live, which I haven't said what it is, um, but the, the rule is, it doesn't matter as long as there's no check engine light and they can plug the thing in and it reads what it wants to read and it gets an okay, then it says, yeah, it's going to work. Um, so, we have a video. So it starts off just, you, you got to start the motor when you get up there. Um, it gets it running, make sure the, come on, move it a little faster. So we can see the dash is running, we have RPMs, it's all working the way you would expect it to. Um, then we get our uh, ODB2 tester out, all right. That one, we plug it in. This is your factory configuration. I know it feels like an eternity when I've been talking this fast, but really it just, so you can see it runs the scan. It show, you can't really see it with the lights, huh? But it's showing like there are two incomplete, it's, or actually more than that in this case because I had reset the motor. We're in running through them, doesn't work. So I reach under there and just kind of move the, uh, pull that cable out, plug in the adapter, and then tuck it back under the dashboard. And I'll just skip forward in the video a second. Here we are. It took about two minutes total to do this, if you can see the timestamp, but I'm impatient. So come on. Okay, there we are. We have it plugged in with the, with the photo that you saw before. And we can see we have zero codes, monitors, they're uh, zero incomplete and 11 ready. So that's, we have it working. Um, I chose specifically not to uh, include any kind of uh, active testing in this presentation. You can extrapolate from that what you want. Um, but you can go to this website as of right after this talk and download the code for this and all the instructions on how to build it. So have fun.